load of them. It's amazing what funny laws there used to be that people had to be told not to do or have their behavior controlled in that way. It's something completely bizarre to us now. I wonder, on this subject, what we'll be laughing at in a hundred years time. Okay, maybe not we, but people will be laughing at it a hundred years time in terms of the laws that we once had. If any of them will be as funny to them or seem as out of place or otherworldly as those ones might have been. Now, yesterday evening, oh, I'm going to try and show you a really nice view of a woodlands kingfisher, but it didn't want to stay. They never do like to flutter off and disappear. So yesterday evening, Abel, one of the guides, called in the fact that Mvula was found after drive around Bookers of Dam. I found his tracks going in from last night. Now it's just a matter of finding his tracks coming out again. So I'm checking the way he came first, just because with leopards, you never know. He might have had a kill somewhere and he came looking for water at Bufflesop Dam before heading back. Otherwise, I'm going to do a loop around the Bufflesop boundary and Cheetah Cutline boundary and see if I can't figure out where he went. The question becomes, of course, the male that James had tracks for. We suspect is Tingana. We don't know it's Tingana. It could be Mbula which means he might have moved from Buffleshook Dam all the way west towards where Teller made access. I don't think he would have done that though, but I'm not terribly sure. There's been a lot of um, malleability between Mvula's boundary and Tingana's boundary. And I know that Tingana is pushing more and more into Mvula's space, but from what I understand, Prior to my arrival at Juma, there was a time when Juma Central was pretty much the core part of Mbula's territory, and Tingana was the interloper from the west. Now with Anderson, with the Anderson male pushing against Tingana, he is now pressuring Mbula, who's reaching the slightly older stage of life. And Tingana's been seen all the way right up to Torchwood, which is on our eastern side of our boundary. Yet somehow, I'm not quite sure. We never know, we just don't know for certain. There's only so much you can judge by tracks. And I have to be honest, I don't think that I'm good enough in terms of being a tracker to judge whether or not I think it's Mbula or Tengana's tracks. I just haven't seen the two of them enough to judge. I would be making things up if I said I knew. Let's go and check around the eastern boundary, see if we can't spot him popping out there. Just to let you know what happened with our root. Please stay, please stay, please stay, please stay. Cute. I'm not gonna get a much clearer view. That is a very new kudu calf staring at us, which is why I'm being quite careful. It's going to be very skittish. Look how tiny that is. It's the size of a baby in Yala. I've seen a lot of very pregnant female kudus recently, but this is the first young, young calf I've seen. This is their peak breeding time, or their peak, birth, peak birthing time. Oh, but you're adorable. Should pop out on the other side of the termite mound, but I think that's the smallest kudu I've seen this year. Are you gonna come out? Yes, she is. How very fortunate for us. I think if we sit nice and still and patiently, she's gonna come out in front of us. Oh, no, she's going, there she comes. Here's your baby, beautiful. Here he comes. 
little one's got every reason to be cautious. There's a lot of dangerous creatures out here, including Mvula, who walked this road just last night. And this baby's only maybe a week or two old, probably about two weeks. I can't see an umbilical cord, but those usually drop off quite quickly in antelope. Skipping to catch up with mom. Okay, can I join? Look how tiny that little one is. Could fit under mom's stomach fairly easily. Still a little bit bow leg, look. The back legs are. <laughs> oh, no, baby, wrong way. Wrong way, silly. Hit your ear. Little one, your mommy's gone. She's going across the road. Here we go. It's okay, you can come out. And Scorpion 73, as this little one crosses in front, you've mentioned how cool you find their stripes. They are awesome. Look at it, little one. <laughs> Such a perfect little miniature of mom. Seems to be baby season. It is baby season. But yes, those stripes are amazing. I described a male earlier that I thought it almost looked like somebody had drawn a line of white paint down its back that had then dripped wet stripes down the sides, if that makes sense. That's what it looks like to me. <laughs> um, but they do actually form quite an important service to the, to the antelope and that's known as a way of breaking up the outline. So those white stripes just disrupt the outline of the kudu ever so slightly so that it becomes less clear exactly where the animal starts and ends. Another one's moving off. Cute. Smallest baby kudu I've seen on a live safari. Maybe some of the viewers who've been watching for extended period of time have seen smaller ones, but that one is very, very new. And we were lucky to see it. It seems as though James and I have done a bit of a swap because he has now found an elephant herd to show you, so let's have a look at them. Merciful heavens, there is an elephant, everybody. We're beginning to think that we'd lost our touch, weren't we, Brian? Mm. Uh, a young elephant bull, well, not that young, probably recently. I haven't seen a, a, the rest of a herd around here, so I'm wondering if that isn't perhaps a, a, a bull who's recently left the herd. There may be some further ahead. I haven't heard any. Listen, let's listen carefully. They're in front of us. So quiet. A herd of elephants in front. One, you can just see the tail moving. There's another one just through here, Brian. You might just be able to pick up a tusk. I may have parked you behind the bush. Now she's turned her head now. There she is. So this bull, like the one we saw this morning, we had a, a view of a bull elephant that um, was a young bull who was not sort of in favor with the herd. He wanted to be away from them. He was a bit cool for school. Same story going on here. This guy will spend more and more time away from the youngsters and his mother as he starts to assert his independence and has his, his independence asserted for him by the mature females within the herd. So they've got those two incisors, which are the tusks, and then four molars in the jaw, chewing away constantly all day long. Now, 
here comes a big cow across the road. And quite possibly the mother of that youngster with the good ivory. You see, she's got beautiful tusks. They're very skinny, which is totally normal for a cow. Thin tusks, rapier-like. She's a beautiful cow. I always feel a little bit sort of odd saying beautiful cow, um, just because of course the cow often has a derogatory, uh, derogatory sense around it. They're all flapping their ears because it's so hot. next to us here. Now he's looking at us. Michael, you want to know, you on YouTube, you want to know if an elephant looks at you straight on or from the side. That elephant is looking straight at us now. They can look at it from the side, of course. They've probably got, well, I'd say, probably 270 degrees at least of vision. size of the elephant Cusick. A big bull, I think we're probably looking at around about 300 kilograms, 660 pounds worth of uh, food every day. So a six ton bull, I think probably like the big one you saw with Jamie earlier, is pushing 300 uh, kilograms a day through that digestive system. And about 200 of that will come out again as dung during the course of the day. So quite a lot, uh, enormous amount of very inefficient digestive system. And then a young, say a 10 year old, I think the original, first, the original measurements were done on a 10 year old cow. She ate about 150 kilos a day. A 10 year old cow probably weigh about half of what a big bull would. Just ease gently forward here. They've been so confiding with us, they've been so good about letting us watch them. So I don't want to irritate them at all. So it's so nice to see big tuskers coming around. It is very nice, Donna. Um, and as I'm sure many of you know, big tuskers have their genes 
Certainly the genes of the enormous big bull elephants that used to be found in this area have pretty much been shot out. And, and they were shot out many, many years ago, of course, by the hunters of the area who came down here ivory hunting in the 19th century. And they obliterated the elephant herds of the area, unfortunately. There are obviously lots of elephants now, but I think the size of the tusks that we see, which is, I mean, as Donna has noticed, we don't see nearly as many big tuskers as you would have, say, 200 years ago. It's beautiful. So peaceful. and see if we can't get a better look at those tusks. We don't want them to be so close to us that we can touch them in water. Not that they touch us. She's just turning to face us. Dam. Now, what they think they're going to find there, I'm not sure. They might have a brief, brief bathe in the very last mud that there is there, but I mean, there really is not a lot. It's 
So maybe they're just eating and they'll bypass the dam entirely or turn around before they get there. some bulls you've obviously seen pictures of bulls that would reach the ground uh, Pamela I think it's unlikely I mean it's even unlikely in the bulls it's very uh, unusual um, would a uh, could a cow I imagine it was possible I'd say probably even less frequently though than a bulls except that their tusks do grow straight down more often than bulls tusks do so yes I suppose it's possible I can't think of an incident incidents where I've seen that though that, Brian? Is that a, an enormous flatulence? Very well of you. I pitched a flatulence there. It's the most impressive performance. Well, I'm not going to go chasing him into this bush. It is quite thick. That cow indicated that she didn't wish to have us too close by. So the dam is just around the corner here. Let's pop up here and see what we can find there. Do you say, why is it that the elephants don't ever seem to be completely comfortable around the vehicles? Um, Kat, I'm not sure I agree with you. I think quite a lot of the time in this area, they're very super relaxed with the vehicles. I mean, we can drive into the middle of a herd and they might give us a look or two and then they just carry on eating. Um, they're certainly less confiding perhaps than, say, a full male lion who's, uh, you know, just eating himself a kudu or something like that because they're a bit more protective of the youngsters. And I think you'll find it's also an experience of human human beings. They obviously come from all over the Kruger Park, these elephants, and they just, they're, no, they're nervous everywhere. Uh, and they're a lot less nervous here than they would be in many other areas. Uh, I, I, they're just quite protective over their youngsters. They're quite careful, they always have been. And I think that they're very comfortable around the vehicles here, especially compared with some other areas that I know of. I think I think you watched those ones with Jamie. And certainly, I think I think Jamie's herd was the same herd. Um, it sounds like the same herd that I had this morning. And I mean, Tebs and I were sitting uh, maybe five meters from one of those bulls, and he didn't even blink at us. He just carried on feeding, moved around, and he was fine. I think sometimes also the bulls, the big bulls, if they're feeling irritated, they'll take it out on anyone. So if they're, say, you, a must bull uh, was feeling frustrated and his testosterone levels were through the roof and he was feeling aggressive and angry and irritated, um, a noisy vehicle, he's going to take that frustration out on. A noisy buffalo or a noisy rhino, even, he might take that frustration out on. Brian was pointing at something, but I think he was flashing the flies. Were you? Right, the dam is just around the corner. Now, for those of you who haven't seen Bivelshoek Dam before, um, I wouldn't be expecting the Hoover Dam. Uh, or indeed, um, what other big dam is there? The Three Gorges Dam, I wouldn't expect that one either. Or Lake Kariba. Hello Elaine from Massachusetts. You're planning a holiday to South Africa in 2017 and you're saying if you stay at Galago, would you be able to meet the safari live? Of course you would. 
absolutely there would be no problem at all and we'd love to have lunch with you thank you elaine we'll take that as an invitation um yes and whatever you choose to serve we will eat with gladness in our hearts here is a little soup dam as you can see a fairly sad affair as a result of the drought there is a water buck coming down. Clearly, a, a, not a local water buck because I don't know what on earth he thinks he's doing down here. Maybe he's just coming down for a walk. Maybe he's out for his evening constitutional. Again, completely silent but for that Franklin that was calling in front of us. This is fascinating. I wonder what this water buck thinks he's doing. Maybe he wants to come and eat some of this green vegetation that is growing out of the mud. He's a very spectacular bull, that one. Hello, Jess. Um, you want to know why we don't ever see any water buck calves? Jess, we do see water buck calves. Um, possibly not as frequently as we see wildebeest and impala babies because they're not quite as seasonal breeding-wise and there are not so many of them. Uh, but we do see them from time to time. I think you'll find that they probably also keep the very little ones hidden away a bit more, a bit longer than the in sort of more open dwelling wildebeest or impala. Last question. He's a spectacular hawk. I'm fascinated to see what he's going to do now. Now that mud of course is not particularly hard underfoot as Andrew and I discovered the other day when we rescued a young impala in the middle of the dam. It was not a pleasant experience for anyone concerned some very sharp edges and very needle-like fish bones in that mud. So this water buck will be wary of walking out and trying to eat that green stuff that's growing in the middle of the dam. But I think that's what he's going for. Rains. There's just a, there's the odd sound of a cricket every so often going, you know, stridulating. All these things are very quiet. Another the wood sandpiper that was here has gone. He's obviously a wading bird. He can't be wading here. Just get a spiky fish bones in his feet if he was trying to wade here. sit here for a few minutes and see what this chap does. Christine in North Carolina, you say you're coming out here in September and um, you want, you've got a question and then you've got a statement. Your statement which I'm laughing at now is that um, you say don't be surprised if you find that you think you're going to burst into tears at the sight of the first animal that you see and and I mustn't be surprised if I'm driving around and we find a, a female from North Carolina blubbing away at the sight of a diker. Um, Christine, I promise I shall be very impressed if you manage to do that. And the reason you've obviously been told that you shouldn't wear black and white. Um, black and white are colours that ref are obvious to see, and they're obvious to see because there simply aren't, isn't a lot of it out here. Black, not so much. White is just a very obvious colour much more so than red or orange because red and orange of course don't reflect light in the same way that white does and also the animals out here are not very good at seeing color so the color is not so much it's more the reflection of the light on it 
You also want to know what animals you shouldn't make eye contact with. You should never make eye contact with your ranger, whoever he is. It can induce a charge and you don't want to do that. Now, in all honesty, Christine, that, that whole thing about eye contact with animals is, is nigh on nonsense, I think. Um, I've, I've never tried it with a wild dog on foot. I haven't tried to make eye contact with a wild dog. I've made contact with eye contact with every other animal out here. And quite unlike a domestic dog, they don't seem to react in the same way. So feel free to look at anything in the eye. You're not going to induce an attack at all, especially if you're sitting on the back of a vehicle. Just come out here and have a great time, which I'm sure is exactly what you're going to do. Remain open-minded, read as much as you can before you get here about the area, and you'll have a wonderful time. Now, Kat, you want to know if they'll eat that grass in the mud there? Kat, yes, they will, definitely, because they, I know the Impala have been eating it in the uh, Juma Dam. I think this one is still a little bit nervy for them. It's still quite, uh, the mud is still soft, and I went in there yesterday to try and retrieve a, um, a bungee cord that Andrew and I had used. And it was a little bit difficult to get into the middle of the dam still. So it looks very solid there, but I think the animals will definitely sink in, and I think that's why that uh, water buck has thought better of going there. Right, Jamie has got some striped ponies. Let's go across and see them, see if they're uh, engaged in any form of a dressage or other equestrian sport, and we'll press on from this uh, slightly depressing dam, uh, but a very beautiful scene nevertheless. We'll see you shortly. Sorry for the slight motion sickness. I'm trying to keep up with my striped ponies. My striped ponies seem determined to move away. <laughs> the stallion behind it, accompanied by the usual cacophony of the end results of digestive processes as they walk along. Always accompanied by that gentle sound, our zebras. Their digestive processes produce copious amounts of gas as a byproduct, which is why they've always got such round tummies as a matter of interest. I'm going to have to roll back some more. Hold on a moment. They were being terribly cooperative just a, just a few moments ago. I'm try and put us in a way that... I'm going to have to turn the vehicle on. He's trying to do so subtly. It isn't working. adjusted for now and I always think that this is probably the best light for viewing zebras this is an early morning they always look particularly striking oh, being as plagued by flowers as we have been throughout this drive Walking quite strangely. There's a slight tentativeness to her stride. I don't know if she's got an injury on the leg. Staring down Buffle's hook cut line. Like these, I wish I had a tail like that. That could help me keep the flies at bay. I have used my ponytail for that in the past. But I just don't think it has quite the same level of coordination. And a very sturdy looking zebra. got it uncertain. Listening off in the direction. 
straight ahead and to the left. It could just be the, a noise even made by another antelope or something like an impala. And because the zebra's not quite sure as to what it is, I'm not going to take any chances by rushing off into a thick bush. You never know when a lion might be lurking. It always pays to have a degree of vigilance. Stock store. Well, I mean, apart from tail and ears. I wonder what's there. I don't know if you could hear that piping whistle in the background. It's a red crested Kohan. Vision of Ingala on Tamil, friend. The other zebra seems less concerned. It's just grazing. Not sure whether the one is waiting for the other to catch up. There we go. Whatever it was deemed to be safe. And zebra now on the move. Stopped again. I think just being extra cautious. I was going to do a quiz for you. I was going to ask you whether it was a male or a female zebra. Um, your answer's there now. The thin stripe between the cheeks of the bottom is of course what gives it away. That's your standard approach to determining the sex of a zebra. They're both stallions. Unfortunately, the one slightly negated the necessity for a quiz. I was going to ask our regular viewers to tell us which one or whether or not it was a male or a female. And usually the best way, unless the animal is demonstrating it quite so clearly, which they don't always do, the best way is to look at the black stripe between the cheeks of the bottom. It's a thin stripe, like a G-string, then it is a male. If it is a much larger stripe, then it is a female. And that's usually, usually, the best way to tell. Uh, it's something I really want to show you, but I want to be in the sunlight for it, before our sunlight disappears completely. Stallions, a leopard is not a threat, so you were wondering if a leopard would ever attempt to take down a zebra. Yes, but only the young ones will only really hunt babies. I've seen leopard kills that have been zebra babies before, or sub-adult zebras at the most, but for larger zebras, for adult zebras, the chances are that they're perfectly safe from zebra, from zebra, from um, something like a leopard. Let's see if I can find a nice patch of sun to show you this most extraordinary creature that I have here. I'll try, I think I'm going to, let's maybe put it here in the sun. Here we go. Now this is a really, truly exquisite beetle. 
It's a royal fruit chafer with a striking white and green color. Now, we found it dead. So what we did was we pulled off one half of the casing. This is actually presented to me by Steph, if I'm completely honest. He showed it to me. And you can see where one half of the back casing has been pulled out to expose the wing with its multitude of colors. And how it hinges and folds in to the outside harder casing. Really, truly beautiful. And the question, the first question I asked is, why does that wing have that incredible inflorescent coloring? That beautiful bluey green shine that we associate with things like starlings. I have absolutely no idea what the answer is. I don't know why it has evolved to have that. But definitely one of the most attractive little insects and actually not that little it's about almost the size of my thumb really really extraordinary looking i'm going to flip it over for you so that you can have a look at the underside you can see the way that the wing folds underneath extraordinary colors Really, really, truly beautiful creature. Something that I'm going to keep hold of and maybe do a little bit more reading about. Let me keep it with me because I find myself sadly lacking in my fruit chafer knowledge, especially the royal fruit chafers. Don't know all that much about them. number of insect species that we've been seeing and Tim you were wondering what's happened to all of the dung beetles most of them have had a chance to reproduce and have died off with the lack of rain and the drought we haven't seen all that many and I'm seeing more and more now that the piles of dung are staying intact and holding their shape much longer than they usually do at this time of year in midsummer now, exactly a year ago, around this time of year, my parents came to visit me. And they were paid a visit by a herd of elephants in the afternoon, in the late afternoon, which they absolutely loved. They were staying at a separate camp down by the river. And <laughs> I wouldn't say that my parents are purely city people, but they're perhaps not as used to the various facets of bush life as I am. And my little brother was there as well. And my little brother and creepy crawlies are not really friends. And my parents were staying at this lodge and they had the lights on. And they were, I wouldn't say, they, their word was attacked by a swarm of dung beetles. It was not quite that dramatic. There were lots of dung beetles flying about because of course they're attracted to the lights. So once they'd finished being attracted to the elephant dung during the day, they were then being zoning in on the lights of the lodge that my parents were staying at. I have never seen such comic reactions in my entire life. It was hilarious. Watching them duck, dive, squeal and run for cover was truly quite hilarious. Um, <laughs> and of course, the fact that I was showing very little sympathy for their plight was not appreciated. <laughs> highly, highly entertaining to watch. There was about two nights that this went on. My parents were plagued, my family was plagued by the attack of the dung beetles. And the entire time my puppy Lexi was racing around having the time of her life. She thought it was the best thing ever. Coming up close to Sydney's dam now, I wanted to just give this area a very thorough check. I know that this is close to where she crossed, or where Karula crossed this morning. I was wondering whether or not whichever male leopard James was tracking might have decided to come for a late afternoon drink. So I thought I'd just come and pay the area a little bit of a visit. It's 
see if anyone's come down to the water. Just going back to our zebra sighting, um, the two stallions that we were with. Diana, you were wondering if zebras make an alarm call. And yes, they do. They make a series of them. The one that we encountered this morning on walk, which was the sort of the sort of low level of alarm alarm call, is the snort. The <laughs> since I'm on a roll with imitating, the zebra saw both him and myself. Got a bit of a fright, but nothing too major, and went. <laughs> And that's just a gentle snort to alert the rest of the herd that there's a potential threat. If there's a really serious, for example, a lion, um, and if they're being chased, or if they're fighting amongst themselves, then they give off an alarm call that sounds very, I can only describe it as similar to the sound of a yellow-billed hornbill, the call of a yellow-billed hornbill. It's a sort of a yip, 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 yip. That's a terrible impression, but you kind of know what I mean. You must have heard that on, I think it was in The Lion King, that yip, yip sound. Um, so yes, Diane, they do make alarm calls, and generally only at serious things. Here's a buffalo herd small buffalo herd. Sydney's down. Milling about. leave our buffalo and continue searching around for where these sneaky leopards might have got off to and in the meantime James is with another of our favorite spotted creatures so let's go and have a look at the hyena den it is not unusual to find me here at this time of the day everybody here we are at the secondary den now I want to give you some updates on the wonderful information sent um, by a viewer today and the information goes as follows firstly all well, the interesting parts of it and we might have to go and visit the other den quickly as well just so that i can complete it um, this viewer has been watching these hyenas for as long as we've been broadcasting which is certainly longer than i've been here and some of the things that i took from it were that of course the one that we've been calling may was actually first sighted in june and should therefore be called to June. Um, so from hence forth May, sorry to do this to you everybody, will be called June. And I did check it and she was absolutely correct. It was seen on the 29th of June, so quite late in June. So that will be June. Now, her guess also was that this little one that we're looking at now is June. And this is her suckling. Uh, she wasn't convinced of this. I'm certainly not convinced of it, and I'll tell you why. I don't think that this female is the one with the scar on her back. So, and I also think that the one with the scar on her back is quite a dominant female, so I wouldn't say that this is her. I might be wrong. The only way for me to tell would be to look at the scar on her back. Um, and, I mean, I know that there are spot pictures, collages of the different hyenas in this clan. Brilliant stuff, it really is amazing. Um, so that's the story here. Then also, across at the other den, which I hadn't noticed, of course, when I should have, I just assumed that November was a female because she was on her own. But there's definitely a distinct picture of her with her penis or pseudo penis extended and there's a definite pinch on the end of it. So it would seem that November is quite possibly not a male, at least not a female, but a male. And it remains to be seen what happened to his or her sibling, most likely his sibling, um, and whether there was in fact a sibling. Maybe he was just born on his own. That does happen with hyenas. 
This one here that we're looking at now is lactating. She was, she stood up. She's a wonderful pose. There with a, a lip tucked behind her foot, at least behind her tooth. Um, she is definitely lactating when she walked down from her normal position over the hole on the right hand side. Her teats are definitely swollen. And I think that there are some very young cubs in this den and they just are too small to come out at this stage. So those are the updates, wonderful stuff we had from, the, from our viewer today. Beautiful, it took me a while to get through it all. I read through the emails twice and sometimes three times to try and sort out what was going on. And if I'm not mistaken, she identified this female as the mother of Ntombela, who, if I'm not mistaken, was born in February last year. Now, I find that astonishing. Um, sort of 18 months is normally the birthing interval for hyenas. So if this is the mother of Ntombela, if I'm not mistaken, born in February, I would be surprised. But the pictures do not lie, and certainly some very obvious spots um, and spot patterns, especially along the flanks this hyena expert viewer has managed to spot. And just to make sure, I, I, it's not that I don't, um, well I don't, I haven't forgotten the name of this viewer. She hasn't sent it through to us. So if you would like to identify yourself, I'm more than happy to give you a very happy and grateful shout out. Um, if you would like to remain the anonymous hyena expert, that's also absolutely fine. So that's what's going on here. So let's sit here for five minutes. Then I think either I will pop across to the other den unless Jamie wishes to go there. I'm not sure if she wants to or not. I'll ask Final Control to ask her. There's no reason that I should monopolize the hyenas. And we'll head across there and just see what's happening there. I'll be interested to see if June, used to be May until five minutes ago, um, is there or if this is, is in fact her. That's an incredible shot of the of the pads there, and you can see the you can see how close together they are, and that's the most ob and how kidney shaped. So those kidney shaped outer pads are of course the most distinctive things you see when you're tracking hyenas or when you're driving along and you see tracks and you think oh maybe they're leopard. And even if you just see the outside scuff of one of those toes, they're easily identifiable from the kidney shape there on those on the pads. Also, the claws will show 99% of the time, which, of course, in the cats, they won't. say you once watched a root canal procedure done on a hyena cat um, that's a uh, that's not an experience most many people can say that they've had um, i've certainly thankfully never had a root canal I've, I've also never watched one on a hyena or any other animal um i'd be fascinated to know where on earth you saw that and you say you were astounded by the size of them yeah they're not small i mean a hyena is a big female is about 70 to 75 kilograms but certainly bigger than i am um, and then pounds, 75 pounds, 75 kilos, would be 170 pounds, so they're not small at all. Like an average sized man, maybe a slightly small man. They're quite, they're quite a lot taller, I think, and larger, heavier than they look when you see them here on the screen. And then teeth there are quite phenomenal things. This one, not the obviously the most enthusiastic hyena in the world, fast asleep. All is at peace. 
Please. Hello, Donna Wan. Um, interesting question. Are we sharing the videos that we're getting at these hyena dens uh, with experts? Um, not as, not at the moment, no. Uh, it certainly would be available to anybody who wanted to come and do hyena research. We would more than happily share the videos with them. Uh, but at the moment, there are no research projects on hyenas going on in this area. So were we to see something absolutely, completely out of the ordinary that nobody had ever seen before, absolutely we're trying get hold of a, a university or a think tank, possibly the University of Pretoria. They've got a great mammal demography unit there. Um, we're going to try and get hold of them. Um, but at the moment, there are no specific hyena projects going on here. Like I say, were any hyena researchers to come to us and say, could we have some footage? I think we'd be more than happy to give it to them. Thank you, Donna Wayne. Good question. All righty, I think that we should leave this for the next little while, head across to the other dam, no, the other dam, to, to the other, eh, the other den, Ooh, hang on. High action, she's opened her eyes and shut them again. All right, let's go and look. So obviously our uh, immobilizer has clicked out. Apparently Jamie's a bit busy, so we can't go across to her right now. So we are going to sit here. So all completely at peace, like I said, very little sound at all going on around the bush. simply a function of the heat. As Brian and I were saying as we were driving along here, uh, very, it feels harsh. You know, every, normally in summer there's some kind of build up of cloud to the west or to the south, and there's an expectation of moisture and rain and a, a breaking of the heat, but now it just continues on and on and on. Okay, let's go across to Jamie and we'll quickly start the car. is the most incredibly beautiful African evening. The temperatures are slowly starting to drop and really there's some incredible feelings that you get being out here in a place like this. I did encounter another nice large elephant bull. The reason I'm not still with him is back to what Monique was saying about the different personalities and he was cross. I'm not sure what his story was. He was a big boy, the same size as the one we saw, but with two completely broken off tusks at the base. And he didn't want us around. It was very clear he did not want us around. And we had a minor battle of wills. And as soon as I felt it was safe, I immediately heeded his message to me and we left the sighting. But it's extraordinary moments like that that bring home exactly the, the parts of Africa that I guess I love the most. And that all important awareness that we are absolutely privileged to get to spend the time that we do in the animal space and enjoy the times that we do spend with them. some amazing moments to be had out here and I consider myself exceptionally lucky to wake up every day and to be as excited as I am to have a chance to go out and work in the job that I do and BM I'm sure you agree best job in the world totally best job in the world I'm very aware of how lucky we are 
believe that James has managed to start Rusty up again once again. Let's pop over to him as he heads out and I will be back with you shortly. So it sounds like exciting time with the elephants there. We've left, we managed to get Rusty start and we've left the hyena den. We're now on our way to the other one. Let's see what happens. We'll go via Gallagher Waterhole. We'll see if there are the great leopards perhaps having a drink there. Really hoping though, and I know maybe some of you have been a little bit frustrated with my continual efforts at this den here. I'm really hoping to see the little ones come out of the hole and show us, show us their metal fairly soon. starting to sink mercifully and again it's a kind of um it's a pale sun sunset because there's nothing in the sky there's no cloud there's no dust to diffuse the light at all like the heat of the day is eventually starting to tail off a bit, which is marvelous. Real kind of September smell around the place though, it doesn't smell like summer at the moment. And the other, you know, there's a bird that normally falls around this time of the year, January, February, uh, the Diederik's cuckoo very vociferous around this time of the year. I've heard a few. A few of them come, came through November, December time, and then they disappeared again. Well, they're around. They also parasitize weavers. I have not seen one active weaver's nest this year. There was one at the hyena, this hyena den, that was active for a little while, and then it just seemed to, as the rain didn't come, it just, all the weaver's nests just seemed to be abandoned. Any yellow weavers for the last little while. Hello, Tyler, age nine. Lovely to have you on board, and I'm glad, as always, to have a young viewer watching us. You want to know if a hyena is more closely related to a dog or a cat? Well, it does look a bit like a dog, doesn't it, Tyler? And certainly when the first um, people arrived, or the first people who were familiar with wolves and dogs arrived in South Africa, they used to call them wolves. Because they, they, they called them. Did some research on them, and they found that they're actually more closely related to cats. And they're most closely related to things like the mongooses, most, and also uh, the viverids, which would be civets and genets. So Tyler, most closely related to dogs and mongoose and civ civets and genets, not closely related to cats at all. Nice question, thank you Tyler. Keep watching, keep sending them through. Ah, some buffles. Some beefs. The ubiquitous beefs at the water holes. So it's lovely to have them. You can always rely on them to be around and for a sighting or two. I'm not going to stop, I'm just going to keep going towards the water hole. Where are the beefies having a drink? While we drive past them, we've only got 20 minutes left, so I just want to go and quickly have a look at the other den. It's quite a circuitous route, it's not actually far. Um, why are we doing that, Sarah, in Ohio? You want to know the marabou storks, which are of course the ugliest bird in Africa. If they 
um, have moved on to an area where there's more water. Yes, Sarah, they definitely have. They don't necessarily need water, but they need to be able to scavenge. And if they can scavenge around water, then that's what they'll do. And there's nothing to scavenge in Pufflesook anymore. All the fishies are, are dead. And the bones litter, the mud there. Stick into you to try and walk there. So, Sarah, yes, absolutely. The marabou stalks have moved on. And they'll be sort of a... Uh, They'll be in a, what's the area there? They'll be in, they'll be in sort of a, what am I want to say here? Uh, fairer climbs, that's what I was searching for. Areas of better water and more to eat. Hello, John in the United States. Uh, you want to know where the hippos are going to go when it gets dry? Will they go down to the Sand River? Yes, they will, but the Sand River apparently has almost stopped flowing. So after that, they're left with the option of going down to the uh, Sabi River, which is further south. Or there's an enormous dam in Manjaleti, which is the reserve to the north of us. They might try and go there, um, but those are the options. And there will definitely be conflict. Those young bulls like Peter who have been tossed out of his, uh, probably the pod into which he was born, uh, they, they're the ones that are really going to struggle. It's the territorial bulls who've got established territories in dams and in rivers that are the ones that are going to see out this drought without too much harm. Right, we're not too far, probably about three minutes from the den site. Two minutes from the den site. Now remember, we did see one kind of June-aged hyena at that den site. A very nice question. I was tempted to be slightly sarcastic with my answer because I wanted to descri uh, describe a scene where the hyenas were found packing their bags and sort of covering the furniture in sheets, taking some of the pictures off the walls, their favorites. You wanted to know basically if, if you can tell if a hyena clan's about to leave the den and then move somewhere else. But Marsha, no, it's as you, as you correctly say, you'll just arrive one day and there won't be anyone home. So that's exactly how it happens. I just had visions of Corky sitting around issuing instructions to the youngsters, or the youngsters running around not doing what they're supposed to, and June packing her little bag, and uh, Pretty packing her bag and her vanity case, of course, and then they're all sitting off for another den. Marsh, that isn't what happens.
November the male. Son of Pretty. Thank you to our hy anonymous hyena expert. And then little D1 and D2, who she reckons one's male, one's female. But is, that is unconfirmed. If I sneak through here, we'll get a view. If I sneak through here, and of course. So far, the most dominant thing we've seen here is Quirky Ruff or Green Margin.
behavior of these social animals is so completely fascinating, especially compared with some of the other animals that we watch. I agree completely. I do think it's massively fascinating, possibly more so than many of the other animals we watch. While the beauty of a leopard is unquestioned, they're solitary, they're solitary kind of living. So the completely fascination of social behavior. Hyena's social behavior can most closely be uh, aligned with the uh, primates, so monkeys and baboons. They have that kind of uh, amazing social structure. in front of Corky with her outer kind of instilling any discipline. It's the first time that November's had this kind of confidence that I've seen. Normally she's very reticent. Certainly is a the best 
way to sort of describe how that works is that um, it's dangerous for a hyena to give birth. Apparently 18% of new mothers die in childbirth because the baby is born through the pseudo-penis. Imagine that. Um, this little one is fascinated by the car. And, and so it's difficult to find an evolutionary reason for why they should have that unless it is an unintended consequence. Now, human beings actually have a similar adaptation where because we stand upright, our hips um, are actually block the birth canal. Now, of course, until the sort of early, or probably mid-20th century, it was extremely dangerous for a human female to give birth. One of the most dangerous things a woman could do because the birth canal, unlike our most other mammals, does not go out behind the hips. It goes through the between the hips. And it's very dangerous for the baby. It's very dangerous for the mother. And that's a consequence of us being bipedal, of us being needing to walk on two legs. I suspect it's a similar unintended evolutionary consequence uh, with the pseudo-penis. It's the best answer I can give you, I'm afraid. I'm James Hendry's fan. I think it's probably accurate. has been a truly spectacular afternoon and I really have loved every minute of being out here. There's certainly nothing like an elephant throwing dirt on you at one point to remind you of exactly where your place is in the world but I've really really enjoyed being out here so thank you for all of you and for your questions as well as to Viam for his fantastic camera work and company. Thank you to the lovely ladies in FC and for Eugene for his technical genius and have a wonderful day wherever you are ladies and gentlemen and we'll catch you for the sunrise safari tomorrow morning. Cheers.